So what about the God you serve? Is he touchable? Is he reachable? Are you able to go to him at any time? Let me tell you about my God. that so many of us Christians have received Jesus as a little God that has to be put up on a pedestal and he's not touchable, but he is just a God, another God that we've added to our list of gods. But I want to tell you today that Jesus is not a God. Jesus is the God. We're told in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted such as we are, yet without sin. Jesus has really been showing himself to me in these last months, weeks, and days. And Jesus is the greatest friend that we can have or we will ever have. It makes me think of an old song we used to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Griefs and Sins to Bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. He cares about the biggest thing in our lives. He cares about the smallest things in our lives. There's nothing too big, too little, too great, too long, too short, but what Jesus is interested in. There's also another old song we used to sing, and it was, Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude and turned the water into wine, to the hungry calleth now, come and dine. That's the kind of Jesus we have. As I was preparing about this, or preparing this, the Lord dropped in my heart how gregarious Jesus was. According to Webster's Dictionary, gregarious means he was fond of being in the company of others. He wasn't aloof. He wasn't so spiritual or so religious. He wasn't touched by people. He was touched by people everywhere he went, and he cared for people. One of the reasons I see Jesus as a gregarious person, the little children loved him and they ran to him, and Jesus loved them. The disciples had a problem with this, and they tried to keep the children away from him, and Jesus told them, said, don't you forbid those children from coming unto me. He wanted the touch of even the children. Jesus was a party guy. He never passed up a party much to the chagrin of the religious ones, the Pharisees and the priests. In fact, the ministry of Jesus started at a wedding party. Everyone was having a great time. And suddenly Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw there was a problem. They were about to run out of wine. Jesus told, uh, Mary told Jesus about the problem and he looked at her and he said, but mom, my time hasn't come yet. And as a little good Jewish woman would do, that mother turned to those servants and said, you do whatever he tells you to do. Jesus looked around and he saw six stone water jugs sitting by. Each of these would hold 20 to 30 gallons worth of water. And Jesus told the servants to take those six water pots and fill them to the full. When they finished filling the six water pots, then he said, Take out a little bit and take to the master of the feast. One taste was all it took, and the master of the feast was overwhelmed with the quality of the wine. He exclaimed, wow, most people serve the very best at the first. Then when everybody is quite happy and their taste buds aren't quite what they were when they came in, they bring out the cheaper wine, but you have held the best till last. Do you understand what a miracle this was? From the time the water was poured into the jug until the time it was dipped out and taken to the master of the feast, not only had the water turned to wine, 
but it had turned to the best wine. Well, the process for this to happen, I'm told, is that wine has to age for many years to become good wine. And on that few minutes journey, from the filling of the jug to the master's table, that had become the best wine. I'm here to proclaim to you today, there is nothing impossible with the God, our God of all gods. Time means nothing to him because he created time and he lives in eternity. He knows no beginning and he knows no end. Whatever situation you are in, however long it has been, in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, Jesus is right there in the middle of your situation. There was another time that Jesus was walking down the street, and I'm sure he was laughing and talking with the people as he went. And there was this little guy who was a tax collector. He was the head tax collector, in fact by profession, and he was not loved at all. He was rather hated and thought of the lowest of the low because he would collect the taxes from the people and then the money would go to other nations. That kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? But he wanted to see this guy that everybody was talking about. So he found himself a tree and up he climbed. He got himself settled and here came Jesus. Jesus not only noticed him, but Jesus called him by name, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had an important appointment with this guy. He just wanted to see, and he didn't even know it. As Jesus looked up in that tree and he saw Zacchaeus, he said immediately, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going home with you today, an unexpected dinner guest. May I tell you that Jesus does know you by name? You are not just a number to him. He knows your name and he wants to go home with you. He wants to stay at your home with you. Jesus knows you so well that he's even counted the hairs on your head, Luke 12, 7 tells us. When John was beheaded, the disciples took his body and they buried it and then they came and they told Jesus. And it grieved Jesus, and immediately Jesus went to a deserted island or a deserted place to be alone for a time. But about 5,000 men, besides the women and the children, followed and came to hear him teach. Jesus healed the people, and he taught them till evening. And the disciples told Jesus, the people need to be sent away so they can get into the city and get something to eat. And Jesus looked at the disciples and said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Immediately, the disciples looked at their own resources and they had no idea how in the world they could put together anything that could feed 5,000 men plus the women and the children. I don't know about you, but many times and maybe even most times, when I feel like the Lord would have me do something like that, I immediately look at my own resources, cutting Jesus out. There was a time um, in the early 60s, we were pastoring a church in Statesville, North Carolina. And we were having a family, they were coming to sing and minister on a weeknight. And we had really advertised it all and were expecting a large crowd. But before these people came, we asked them, do you need to have dinner ready? We'll have dinner for you. And they said, no, we'll have dinner before we get there. And then we said, well, do you need rooms to sleep in? We'll prepare a place for you to stay. And they said, oh no, we'll sleep on our own bus. So right at supper time, after I have made our little pot of spaghetti for us four, H.L. me, Debbie about six, Daryl about four, up drives this bus, out come all of these seven adults. They have not eaten and they're planning to spend the night in my house. Needless to say, it took me back quite a bit. bit. I quickly called a friend. I said, please pray. I can't talk now, but please pray. And I went out in the backyard and I looked up at the Lord and I said, Lord, 
and I reminded him of the time the 5,000 had been fed. And they were fed with the five loaves and two fish with stuff left over, food left over. And I reminded the Lord of that. And I said, Lord, I need help. They came in. I set the table for all of us. We sat down and we ate. And as far as I know, they were all filled. I still don't know how it happened except Jesus supplied the need. But among the crowd that day, they found this little boy. And he had seven loaves, I mean five loaves and two fish for 5,000 people plus. Jesus had everyone sit down. You always sit down for a good meal or a nice meal, don't you? He blessed those five loaves and those two fish, and he gave them to the disciples to distribute. Every time someone took out a portion, it was as if nothing had ever even been taken out. It went around that company of people that could have, say a man had a wife with him. That makes 10,000 people right there. Say they each had two children, and you can see how the number multiplies, and it could have been several thousand people. And when everybody had finished eating, and they took up the leftovers, that little boy had 12 baskets full of food to take home with him. That's found in Matthew 14 and John 6. Jesus supplies our needs exceedingly. At another large dinner, they had only 4,000 men plus the women and children this time. Jesus and the disciples had gone to a deserted place in the mountain. And then the word tells us in Matthew 15, great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Jesus healed them all. They were gathered there with all that happening for three days and had nothing to eat. Imagine that. And Jesus told the disciples he didn't want to release them and send them on their way in case they fainted or something from not eating. And so Jesus asked the disciples, how many loaves do you have? And this time they had the seven loaves and several fish. Again, Jesus had everyone sit down and he gave thanks, and he broke the bread. He handed it to the disciples, and once again, they gave it out till everybody had eaten all they wanted, and they still had more than enough. They ate till everyone was full, and this time there were seven baskets of food left over. Abundance again. In Ephesians 3, 20, 21 in the Amplified Bible, it says, now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, our hopes, or our dreams, according to his power that is work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Another time, there was this family in Bethany that Jesus loved very much, and he spent as much time with them as he could. It was Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Most of us remember that story very well. Most of us really remember Martha. Martha was the one in the kitchen, always doing the work and preparing the meal, while Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to his every word. Martha did the work and complained, and Mary's work was sitting and listening to Jesus. In John 11, it tells us that one day, Jesus got word that Lazarus was very sick. Jesus shared it with his disciples, but he told them the sickness was not unto death that God was going to get the glory from this. Then Jesus waited another two days to go, and he told the disciples that Lazarus was sleeping, so they all just wanted to go wake Lazarus up. 
And then finally he told the disciples, no, Lazarus isn't just sleeping, Lazarus is dead. So Thomas wanted to go and all of them died with Lazarus. Don't we see that in today's world? There's either those that are ready to go and wake people up and be on the job, and then there's a, that want to just die with whoever's dying at the time. When Jesus arrived at the scene, Martha met him. And with great sadness, she said to him that Lazarus had passed away four days before. Jesus, if only you would have been here, my brother would have lived and not died. Martha thought Jesus had arrived too late, but his late coming was very purposeful. He was going to raise up Lazarus for the world to see and to believe. And Jesus told Martha said that Lazarus was going to rise again. And Martha said, oh, I know that. There's coming a day, and at the resurrection, at that last day, he will live again. And Jesus looked at her. Can you imagine the look? Jesus must have looked into the depths of her eyes. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha just could not understand that she was looking face to face at the resurrection and the life. How awesome. She knew that, yes, somewhere, sometime, someday in the future, there was going to be a resurrection, but she didn't yet know the person that was standing in front of her who was the resurrection and the life. Before Mary, Martha ran to get Mary, though, she said, Yes, Lord, I do believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Suddenly, the resurrection and life had entered Martha's spirit, and she recognized who she was speaking to. When Mary got there, she looked at Jesus and she said, Lord, if you would have only been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus asked him, well, where did you put him? And he was very troubled in his spirit to see them weeping like they were. And Jesus wept. People around said, oh, look how much he loved him. But Jesus wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. He was there to raise him up. Why would he weep over death when he knew life was there in the next couple of minutes? I believe Jesus was weeping at all the unbelief that was around him. Jesus asked that the stone be rolled away, and Martha was concerned about that because Lazarus had been in that grave for four days, and she said, Jesus, there's going to be such a stench. But Jesus stepped before that tomb and prayed to the Father. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Some people wouldn't believe if Jesus would have just called Lazarus forth. They had to see him pray and ask God to be involved in the situation when he was God. He then loudly called, Lazarus, come forth. I believe if he had not been specific as to whom he was calling to come forth, I believe that everyone in that cemetery would have come alive. I really believe that. When Jesus spoke, Lazarus, come forth, out of the tomb came Lazarus, still wrapped in his grave clothes with even his face covered. And Jesus then said to all the people standing around, loose him and let him go. Many people came to believe upon Jesus that day because of his raising Lazarus from the dead. It may look like your situation is hopeless. It may look like it will never change. It may look like it has been too long. But I'm telling you, our God is able to change the situation. 
Shortly thereafter, and six days before the Passover, Jesus came back to visit Lazarus, Mary, and Martha and have dinner with them once again. And this time it would be their last dinner together. Martha was doing her thing and serving the meal. Jesus was at the table with Lazarus, and Mary is once again at the feet of Jesus. Only this time she had a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. She was anointing the feet of Jesus with this costly oil and then drying them with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of that very costly oil. Mary had been forgiven of much sin, and she was so in love with Jesus because he had so changed her life. But sitting over in the corner was Judas, and Judas was not a happy camper because, you see, he was the treasurer of Jesus' uh, ministry, and ever so often he took out a little bit of the money for himself. He was upset that the oil wasn't sold and the proceeds given to the poor. Oh, that will preach, but I won't do that now. Jesus told Judas to let Mary alone. Listen to this, folks. The poor are going to be here always. There's always going to be the poor. But Mary wasn't about the poor at that time. Mary was about anointing Jesus Christ for his burial. The very next day, Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem with the throngs of people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And these were the same people who that just a few days later were going to stand by and watch him as he was crucified. Jesus was on his way to his last supper with his disciples before Judas ran and betrayed him. Little did they know that things were going to happen so quickly. And little did they know that the things were going to happen so differently than they were expecting. That evening, Jesus took bread with his disciples, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And as he held the bread up, he said, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Every time we partake of communion, we are once again partaking of communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're receiving all that Jesus bought for us on that old rugged cross that day. And we're remembering him, not in a sorrowful way, but rejoicing in him because he arose. He arose. He's not in that grave. He's living and seated at the right hand of God our Father today. That same night, Jesus went around that table and he washed the feet of every one of those disciples. Imagine that. There said his betrayer. And Jesus knew Judas was the one. But he still broke bread with him. And he washed his feet. And Judas had the chance to repent. Judas could have changed it all right then. And that same evening, Jesus warned Peter that Satan was coming to sift him as wheat, but Jesus was praying for his faith to not fail him. Jesus also told Peter that before the rooster crowed that next morning, he would deny Jesus three times. And standing around a fire that particular night three times, Peter even swore and denied he ever need, knew Jesus as Jesus was being mistreated and questioned by the Sanhedrin. After his third denial, the rooster crowed, and Peter wept bitterly. Can you imagine the sorrow he must have felt? That horrific day came, 
and Jesus was crucified and put into a barred tomb. But the most amazing thing happened on the third day. Two women went to the tomb and Jesus wasn't there. They ran to tell the good news to the disciples who were holed up in a room somewhere because of fear. And after that, Jesus was seen by his disciples many times during the 40 days before he was taken up in the clouds to be at the right hand of God the Father. One day after that, Peter decided he was going fishing. So the other disciples decided to join him and they fished all night to no avail. Nothing was biting at all. Then someone on the beach that morning called to them and said, Children, do you have any food? And they answered, No. And he told them to cast his nets on the other side of the boat. And they were caught so many fish that they could not bring the net into the boat. They had to drag the net all the way back to the shore behind the boat. When the net filled up, Peter said, oh, it's the Lord. And once again, Peter jumped overboard, and this time he swam to shore. When they all got there, Jesus had a campfire going with fish and bread on it and asked them to bring over more fish. Let me tell you something about Jesus. I love this. The last time Peter had seen a campfire, he had stood there and even swore, denying he ever knew Jesus. That would have been his memory for the rest of his life. But Jesus, Jesus built a campfire with food on it and ended up asking Peter to feed his sheep. What a memory for Peter. God is good and Jesus is real. If you don't know this Jesus as your personal Savior today, he tells us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you on behalf of anyone that is seeing this video today. And Father, if they don't know this Jesus, I pray that they will confess him as Lord with their mouth. And they will believe in their heart that you have raised him from the dead. And Father, we'll spend eternity together. We'll be in your presence together. We shall be saved. I thank you and I bless you and I praise your name for who you are, what you are, and what is happening is, is about to happen. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm in Christ and he sees Christ when he's looking at me, then he's pleased. We see the culture of the kingdom is actually, actually the fruit of the Spirit. It is nothing that I have done, but God has done it all. So receive good news today. It is only from the Word of God that faith comes. And I keep hearing his voice saying, Jan, I got this. So I'm here to tell you he's got it. This is where a different kind of grace enters in. It's the grace that says, I know you are and I'm going to bless you anyway. From all of us at Sea Life Ministries, Happy New Year!